Let's just uh, pray as we, we start together. Father, I just want to thank you for this time that we can share together. And uh, we can really, um, as, as we were discussing before, we, we can really trust you in all that, um, that you're doing in our lives. And Father, I just pray that, that your Holy Spirit, who is present right here, um, you'd speak very, very clearly. And may, may we just know both your reality, your power, as well as your love. <clears throat> is my is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Stephen <clears throat> Blanchard, um, and I'll put his picture up for you. Stephen Blanchard walked up to, to the front door of, of the house, and um, you could tell he was very, very determined, even, even a little bit angry. And he knocked very loudly at the front door. And as, as the door swung open, the person inside the house scowled as soon as he recognised Stephen. What do you want? And Stephen said to him, look, mate, all we want is the baby. Just hand over the baby, that's, that's all. And the guy in the house just slammed the door. Bang! And Stephen sighed. It was like it, it had always been with, with his brother-in-law. His brother-in-law had always been so possessive. You know, what's mine is mine and nobody else's is going to get it. He hadn't changed at all. And as Stephen walked away, he, he walked away with this discouraged, dejected look on his face. It actually took a court order from the Parramatta Family Court to finally pry baby Trudy out of his, her father's arms and back into the arms of her mother, Andrea. A couple months later... Stephen um, was walking home. He finished late at night on the 22nd of February 1980, following the route that he always took back home to his place, a place where Andrea and Trudy had taken um, refuge. He opened the, the front door, walked past the, the front room of the house. There, Andrea and Trudy were, were sleeping peacefully in the front room. He walked all the way to the back room, and exhausted from his day work at the, the working men's club, the club, he fell into to bed. As darkness and quietness settled on that house, a couple of hours later, there was a click at the front door, and slowly the door opened, and someone very quietly walked past the front room of that house, all the way to the back room, opened Stephen's door, walked up to the bed, bang, shot Stephen in the head. And as Stephen's body fell limp, the person grabbed the body, picked it up, put it on his shoulder, walked out of that house beside those two sleeping mother and daughter, put the, put the body in, in a car, drove to Cohen uh, Creek, wrapped 11 bricks around that body and then threw it in the river. Threw it in the river. It took days for the police to actually find where Stephen actually ended up. And during that time, the, the, the father, Len, and the mother were still battling it out for the custody of, of Trudy. And the, the pa Parramatta Family Court made the decision, the judge there, Judge David Opus, uh, judge, which you see up there, saw Judge David Opeth, saw the, the issue, saw the personality, and basically came down in favour of the mother, Andrea, and basically restricted the access of, of the father, Len, to, to the daughter, restricted it down, his access down even further. A couple of months later, in Wallara, in, in the home of David Opeth, the, um, the family was sitting there at, um, at the table having their dinner. And as they were sitting there, they, the doorbell rang, ding dong. And as um, David went up to, to go to the door, he opened the door and he heard a, the car alarm going off. He walked outside to, to see why the alarm was going off. As he walked around the corner, bang straight in the stomach of Judge David Opetz. He fell to the ground, and his wife, not knowing what happened, 
about 20 minutes later, came out and found her husband lying unconscious on the ground. Following close behind was, was her or their son, Joshua, and he saw his dad lying there. Judge Opeth died later that night in hospitals, in hospital. Four deaths, five bombings, and basically dozens of people killed by, by um, the same person. And yet it is, it's actually been one of the most significant unsolved serial crimes in the history of Australia. They, and um, there was one prime suspect, one prime suspect that linked all of them. It was the father of little, the little girl, Trudy. The problem was that police could not find any evidence, substantial evidence, that they could pin this, this convict, this, this person, sorry, I should say, down. Until now, until now. They just could not pin, pin it down, this, this guy who was connected with each and every of those crimes. Until now, until now. You see, Andrea's sister Judy had joined a church in Casella. She had joined a church in Casella and was going there regularly. And Casella happened to be very close to where Len actually lived. And on the 21st of July, 1985, when about 100 people gathered to worship for their weekly worship service, as much like weekly worship service, much like what we have now, as they worshipped together, a huge bomb went off, destroying their church and killing one of their, their members and also maiming and, and um, injuring dozens more. Still, even with this church bombing, there was not enough evidence to, to uh, charge Len. They just couldn't nail him. But turn the clock forward 30 years. Turn the clock forward 30 years. The police decided to continue to pursue this case. And what they did is that they found a sample of blood in the church. They took it to the lab and they tested it. They tested the DNA. And what they found was an absolutely perfect match with Len Warwick. They'd finally had what they needed. 30 years later, after all of those crimes, they, they uh, worked out when he was going to go to the gym, when he only would have his gym clothes on, no weapons. They, they surrounded the gym and basically um, gra uh, grabbed Len Warwick. Then they went to search his, his property as well. You know, what was it that made the difference? What was it that 30 years ago they couldn't, they couldn't nail Len Warwick? It was simply this. They found a sample of DNA which allowed them to have a perfect match with this person. Now, of course, DNA is a very sophisticated technique that they've only developed in recent years. But for over 100 years, they've used fingerprints which is the same, a similar kind of forensic technique. It actually happened um, in 1910. There was a guy who'd been painting his railing during the day. When he came inside that night, he went to bed with his family. His, uh, the family heard a sound. He went out to check. There was a scuffle, and uh, the guy was shot. When police looked around that, um, that home, they went to, to the window where this railing was, and there on the railing was four incredibly clear, distinctive finger marks. And they're able to, to, to pinpoint, able to match perfectly, perfectly the person who'd done it. And the other thing, though, is, of course, maybe sometimes you don't have enough time to actually do a DNA um, test. You don't have enough evidence to use fingerprints. What about at the, the bank? I happen to bank with HSBC, so... Hong Kong Shanghai Banking Corporation. And sometimes maybe I've, I've forgotten my customer identification number or my customer service number or PIN or whatever. And so instead of the, the customer service agent just hanging up the phone on me saying, I refuse to work with you um, or even help you out, what the, what's the um, person will do, the lady on the phone or the, or the guy, they'll go through a security check with me and they'll ask me a whole list of questions. First of all, they ask me, what is the date of your birthday? 
and I rattle it off. 11th of September, 1974. What is, what is your home address? And I'll rattle that off for them as well. What is, where were you born? And I'll rattle that off for them as well. What's your mother's maiden name? And then finally, how many accounts do you have with HSBC? And by the time they've gone through the, the HSBC um, security check, they have figured out enough information to know that I'm the person that, that belongs or, or owns those accounts. They know that they can trust to, to, to go ahead and work with me to talk about my uh, bank account information because they've gone through, through the, the security check with me. It's, it's really, really amazing. Now, imagine though, imagine this, that, that you had never met me before. You'd never met uh, me before. You, you hadn't come to a, a presentation that I'd made here at, at Fountain or you hadn't seen anything on YouTube or, or whatever. And um, you came up to me and told me, I know exactly who you are. I know everything about you. You know, I'd stand there sort of, sort of a little bit shocked, a little bit suspicious. But I, I guess my curiosity would get the better of me. But imagine if you went on to tell me this. You know, you were born in, in Chunwan Adventist Hospital in, in Hong Kong. You have a twin sister who's, who's um, seven minutes younger than you, and her name is Genevieve. And she, she works as a pediatrician in Auckland. Your, your father was born in Nikailabi in Finland, but he, he speaks uh, Swedish. Your mum was, um, was born in, in Riverton in New Zealand at the end of the South Island. You, they, they met in, in Newcastle, the Royal Newcastle Hospital. You, they, they, they went on to get married and, and, and live in Warburton down in Victoria. And you, you went to high school. You went to high school at the United Christian College at Shek Kip May in, in, in Hong Kong. You know, when you finished high school, you were thinking of doing either music, uh, you were thinking of mathematics, theology, or electrical or engineering. And, and uh, when, when you'd finished that, all of that in, in Christchurch, New Zealand, you then went to, to, to England, to, to Cambridge, where, where you lived with an atheist by the name of Jane, who was half Polish, half English. And, and you shared a, a house in Belmore, uh, Belmore Close. And you met your wife. You met your wife at the University of Queensland, an outreach program for that was called the God Theorem. You know, I'd be standing there going, incredible. And then suddenly I'd be going like, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. Somebody has given you inside information. Somebody has has given you all this information that knows me so well that you can know all these details. Or maybe you were just trawling through Facebook and you got all the information there. You know, the incredible thing is this. The incredible thing is this, is that what we have with, with um, Jesus is exactly the same thing. We have an a identity check for the, for the Messiah, that, that is so detailed, it's, it's like rattling off all of those details about me. It's absolutely incredible. The Messiah, of course, was the person that God was going to send into the world to, to deal with the incredible, almost unseemly solve, uh, uh, problem that you couldn't even solve uh, with, with suffering and pain and death. And God was going to send that person in. You know, the, the reality is that, that Adam and Eve broke their relationship with God. They, they didn't trust him. They broke that at the Garden of Eden. And yet God came and said, I'm going to send you someone. Even though you've chosen to walk away from me, I'm going to send you someone who will be able to, to bring, you, bring you back. Now, of course, as, as we know from the Bible, Satan was there to deceive. And he was even going to try and deceive people about who the Messiah was as well. And so God was, was so committed, so, so um, um, he wanted so much for us to know who the Messiah was that he gave incredible information about who this person was. He gave it to, to prof uh, prophets, messengers of God. And it's amazing what information we have. Just come through with me. The, the information that we have about the Messiah, first of all, that we have have the prophecy about his birthplace. It's found in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. It says this in, in Micah, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for, for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, 
from old, from ancient times. You know, the Bible prophecy says that Jesus' birthplace, which he could not have arranged by himself, was going to be Bethlehem. The Messiah's place of birth was going to be Bethlehem. Amazing um, uh, detailed information. But not only that, it keeps on going as well. Not only his birthplace, but even his conception as well. In the book Isaiah, which was written 600 years before, it says this, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Manuel, which means God with us. You know, the Bible says that there's, there's going to be something supernatural, something miraculous about the conception of Jesus. In fact, it's going to be a virgin who's, who's never um, slept with a man will actually conceive the Messiah. Absolutely amazing. But it goes on. There's more than that. In, in, in Isaiah, if you go forward a couple of chapters, the, the, the book of Isaiah tells us where the Messiah would actually work, do his ministry. It says in, in Isaiah chapter 9, in the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. Amazing. The Bible actually says the Messiah is going to come and work in the land of, of Galilee. Beyond, beyond the Jordan. Amazing. Not only that, it even goes on as well and tells us a type of ministry that he'd have. Back in Deuteronomy, way back with Moses, Moses told the people of Israel, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your bro brothers. It is to him you shall listen. God said, I'm going to raise up a prophet, a, a person who speaks messages from God, a person who can look into the future and tell us, tell us what's going to happen. It's going to come from your brothers. It's going to, he's going to be a Jewish person. And, and Moses said, you need to listen to him. He's got the same authority as me. That's, that's another of the, the prophecies about the Messiah. Then it goes on as well. And I love this one because I love maths and, and science as well. The Bible actually tells us the timing of, of the Messiah's coming as well. In Daniel, Daniel chapter 9, it says this, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until the Messiah, the prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again in the wall, even in troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood until the end of war Desolations are determined. So what it's saying is this. There'll come a decree when uh, uh, the city of Jerusalem will, will be um, uh, commanded to be restore, uh, rebuilt. But then there'll be a particular time period from that time until the Messiah comes. And then after the Messiah comes, um, the, the city of uh, Jerusalem will be destroyed as well. Amazing, amazing prophecy. Not only about the timing, but the purpose of his death as well. And you find this again in Isaiah. This beautiful, beautiful passage, it says this, He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was a chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. You know, um, the Messiah would die for a purpose, and the purpose was to, 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 to solve our problem of sin, solve our destructive behaviours and the distance that is between us and God. But not only the purpose of his death, and this is amazing as well, also the very circumstances around his death too. In chapter... Um, Psalm chapter 22, um, it paints the picture of what would happen at Jesus' death as well. It says this, All who see me mock me. They make mouths of me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in me. And then it goes on, A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing they cast lots. 
You know, the Bible actually says hundreds of years before the Messiah would come that they would pierce the Messiah, both hands and feet. And not only that, people would gamble for his clothes at the very foot of his, where he was dying as well. And then we come to, to the, uh, one of the last one we're going to look at this, uh, this afternoon, and that is this, the very nature of what happened to, to the Messiah after his death. And it says in Psalms um, 16, I have set the Lord always before me because he's at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure, for you will not abandon my soul to the grave or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the paths of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At, the, at your right hands are pleasures forevermore. You know, the Bible says that the Messiah, even though he would die for a specific purpose, he would not be abandoned to the grave. He would not decay in the grave, but that he would see um, eternal life. He would follow or know the, the path of eternal life. Absolutely, absolutely amazing. You know, it's incredible. You know, the, the identity check for, for the Messiah is absolutely amazing. All of that information... And that's only some of the, the, the prophecies. That's only eight of them. There, there's over 40 um, um, prophecies that, that point to the Messiah in the Bible. And you know, I can, I can tell you with all honesty and with complete um, confidence, there is only one person, there's only one person who fulfills all of those identity checks down, bang, 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 bang. There's only one person, and that is Jesus. That's Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the person who was born in Bethlehem with all of those things that, that you saw up there. You know, Jesus is the Messiah that God sent into this world to save us from sin, destruction, and death. And God so wanted us to know. He was so committed, so, so um, um, interested in us knowing who the Messiah was that he gave us all of those um, identity details, all of those prophecies to, 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 for us to know that this really is the Messiah. This is Jesus. This is the person that God has sent. You know, it's interesting um, that Peter Stoner, who, ha, who was a professor of mathematics, actually went through and he decided to do a calculation. What was the probability that the Bible authors, if they just randomly selected places of birth and death circumstances and places where, where the Messiah would minister, what if, what if they were to randomly or if they could do their best, try and pick out places of where the Messiah would work, where he would be born, what would happen when he died, even the timing. And he did, he did a calculation of what that probability would be. And what he found was absolutely mind-blowing, absolutely mind-blowing. Let me illustrate for you. I know you've probably been wondering uh, what um, is up here in the front, and I know that Barons and, and Tim and those guys have been very, very interested as well. But I have down here a, a bowl of, of coins. So I might need the, the lights on just to um, illustrate these, these coins. So I have a... I have a a bowl of coins here. Um, they're just um, 10 cents. There are a few 20 cents coins in there, I must admit. And um, uh, fill, just filled up that dish there. Now, I've got another 10 cents right here. I'm not sure if you can, you can see it. Uh, but I've, I've actually coloured in one of the faces of, of that coin. And it's, it's red. Used a red permanent marker. So put it on the screen so it's a bit bigger. So coloured it in. Uh, like that. And um, what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to bury this, this coin in, um, in all of these coins. So somewhere in there is, the, is a coin with a, with a red face. And um, you, can be, you can be sure, I, I tried to rub off the red and it didn't come off. Permanent marker. Now, does anybody uh, really love money in this room? Yeah, yeah. Not, not game to, to say. What, okay, that, that's, that sounds a bit materialistic, doesn't it? Let, let, me, let me change it. I should have said, does anybody love coins? Yeah? Love coins. Okay, so we've got one person here. So would you like to volunteer to come out 
and um, to try and find that coin. So the, the, um, the conditions are you have, you, you have to look away and you only get one, one chance to get it, okay? So you, you want to give it a go? You up to give it a go? Okay, come on out. So um, what your goal is, is to try and find the, the one single coin uh, which is red. Now, I'll give you the number. So there's 1,150 coins in this, in this jar. So you have to look away. You can't, you can't look down there. And you can stir around as long as you want. Not too long. And um, you, you have one go to try and find uh, the red coin. Ready to give it a go? Okay, give it a go. Is it red? Oh. No, put it back, put it back. Anybody else like to give it a go? Okay, you, uh, you sir. Yep, come down. You're a kid. You're still a sir. You're still a sir. Come, come down. So I have to stir it up a bit. There we go. So come on down. And uh, remember, you have to look away, and uh, you only have one chance. So you, you, can't, you can't cheat, and uh, you can't have multiple times. Yeah? You reckon you look, look away? Okay, give it a go. Put your... You can go as deep as you want. Or as you can go top, middle. Is it red? No. No. Oh, no. Anybody else like to give it a go? Okay, come, come down the front here. Let me... Okay, so you know the drill? You have to look away. You get one chance to give it a, find the coin. And it has nothing to do with size. So there's 20s and 10s, so you don't... No. Okay, so three, three goes, three different people. And, um, of course, if you do the, the, the maths of this, the, the probability that you would find that coin is one in, in a thousand. That's, that's simple uh, probability. Because, um, sorry, there, there's a few more. I should have put 1,150, but um, roughly that. So, so that's the probability that you would find that red coin. Now, there was, uh, there was some of you who are really quite excited. Obviously, you really like money here. And um, uh, so you're really quite keen to try and find it. But let me change the scenario. Let's say, for example, that I'd been able to talk the HSBC bank to give me enough coins to fill all the, uh, the bottom of this lecture theatre with coins, up to, to half a metre with coins. And I painted just one coin red, one side red. I buried in it, and I asked any of you, you come along here, and you, you can walk around. You can't, you can't look, so you're blindfolded. You can walk around, and then you can reach once down, and you pick it up. How, what do you think the probability of finding that, that coin would be? Would anybody be willing to do it, give it a go? Maybe somebody would give it a go. Let me change it. What about, what about if I got enough coins, enough trucks of coins from the HSBC bank to, to fill the entire UTS campus? Well, there's a few different buildings, but maybe this entire building with coins all the way to, to that level. I painted one coin red and invited you to go and try and find it. What about, what about if I uh, even covered the whole of New South Wales? You know, the probability, the probability that the, the uh, Bible um, authors, the Bible prophets, got eight of, of the prophecies about Jesus right, in terms of who he was, the identity check, is one in 10 to the power 17. That's equivalent to me covering the whole state of New South Wales with coins up to one, a half a metre and then giving you an opportunity to walk around the whole state of, of New South Wales and one opportunity to reach down and pick it up. Do you reckon you could do it? The probability is almost impossible. And the thing is this, remember this, that that's only eight that's only eight of the, the prophecies about, about Jesus. In fact, we've got 48 or, or even more, all the way up to 60. If there was 48 prophecies for the Messiah that we tried to get right by simply randomly picking information for the Messiah or, or using our best knowledge, but without divine help, the probability of getting that right would be 1 in 10 to the power, 157. 
That's one with 157 zeros after it. Absolutely amazing. Do you know that that number is bigger than the number of atoms in the entire universe? The probability that all of the prophecies match Jesus is like finding one atom in the whole of the universe and getting it right. Absolutely, absolutely incredible. You know, and that's the fascinating thing is this, is that Jesus actually did it. He actually matched all of those prophecies. He matched all of those prophecies. You know, that is how far God is willing to, to go for you. God not only sent Jesus from heaven to earth to die for you on the cross, he gave information to, to human beings down through the centuries, hundreds of years before Jesus even came, so that you could have this kind of pro- probability of knowing that Jesus is the Messiah. Nobody else matches the person that God sent to solve your problem of sin, your problem of pain and suffering, so that you could, could look into the future and not just say that death is the end of it all. No, you could say, I can have confidence that if Jesus is the Messiah, if he was raised back to life, I can have eternal life. I can be with Jesus, I can be with Jesus and live in God's kingdom forever. That's the kind of commitment that God has for you. Absolutely incredible. And the question is this. What is your, your response to Jesus going to be? What is your response going to be? Are you going to say, thank you. Thank you for coming all this way. Thank you for passing the most stringent, the most tight, the most detailed identity check this world has ever seen. What is your response going to be? On the 20th of March, 1980, there was a seismograph reading at a Californian volcano monitoring station. A moderately large earthquake was rattling the side of Mount St. Helens, a volcano that had lain dormant for over 123 years. The seismologist who was watching these, these jagged lines on the seismograph raced to call his supervisor. Something significant was happening here. Something was going to happen. Over the next few days, 174 shocks would hit that mountain. Bang, bang, bang. There was one particular volcanologist, David Johnson, and we can see him here, who was was familiar with volcanoes. He started to read all of the the seismograph readings of what was happening in in uh, Mount St. Helens. He he watched the the flumes of of steam coming from the mountain. He even went down into the uh, the crater itself to, to test and see what was happening. You know, he knew the danger. He could, he could spot the readings. He, he understood what was going on. And it was because of him, he was one of the key influencers, because he passionately went to the, the officials and said, we need to, to lock down this area. We need to stop people from coming into this area. We need to start evacuating people out of this area from Spirit Lake, because I know the danger that they're in. I know the danger that they're in. And you know, that's what exactly what happened. The officials came to the houses of people and they said, um, the the most experienced volcanologists in our state know that something is happening to this this volcano. Come with us. Come with us to safety. And many people responded and accepted their invitation for rescue, except, except for one. And his name was Harry Truman. Harry Truman refuse to leave. I'm going to stay right here. I'm going to stay right here with my 16 cats. And um, Harry Harry told the National Geographic team, you know, officials from the US government, the United States government, with all the right identification, badges, the, the, the wallets, all of that, the uniforms, all of that came and pleaded with Harry Truman, please come and, and, and we, want, we are here to, to rescue you. Harry Truman refused. He refused to accept their offer of rescue. On Sunday morning, the 18th of May, 1980, at 8.32 a.m., an earthquake hit the north side 
of, of Mount St. Helens, and it, causing a landslide, which is the biggest which has ever been observed, ever recorded in the world. What happened was that the, the landslide tore open the, uh, the side of the mountain, exposing molten lava and rock to the atmosphere. What followed from that was a, an eruption which, which basically blew this mountain, the top of the mountain, apart. In that, in that eruption, Mount St. Helens um, released 24 megatons of thermal energy. That's equivalent to 1,600 times the amount of energy that was released by the atomic bomb which hit Hiroshima at the end of the Second World War. One particular pyroclastic flow headed straight towards a particular lodge, gathering speed. Down that mountain, that pyroclastic uh, flow headed and absolutely wiped out this lodge, killing a man called Harry Truman and his 16 cats as well. It buried um, Harry's lodge under 46 metres of debris. It completely destroyed the lake that he was living beside. And you know, the amazing thing is this, is that Harry could have lived if he'd only accepted the invitation, the pleading, the offer to be rescued. And the reality is this, that happened in 1980. 1980, the same year that Stephen Blanchard was murdered in the dead of night. But you know, right now, right here, Jesus is present and he is pleading with you. He is pleading with you. He's saying, I am God's official representative. Come here to rescue you from sin and um, destruction. And the question is, what are you going to do about it? No other person matches his identity check. Check birthplace, check conception, check where he worked, check how he was going to die. Everything matches up. It points to Jesus with a probability of 1 in 10 to the power, 157. Absolutely amazing. And the question is this, this afternoon, what is your response going to be to Jesus? What is your response going to be Jesus? Are you going to respond like Harry Truman and say to Jesus, I'm going to stay right here, right where I am. I am going nowhere. I am not coming with you. You know, because there is a destruction that's coming. You know, people who, who have watched the times and, and are reading what's happening in this world are recognising it's not just a volcano at Mount St. Helens, but this entire world is showing the signs of, of breaking down in the social world, in the, in the, in the, in the legal world, in the, in the climate everything we see around us. And the question is, what is your response going to be? Or are you going to say to Jesus, yes, yes, I accept your offer because you passed the most amazing identity check that I've ever seen. You know, the way that you lived your life, I can trust you. I can trust you because you rose from the dead. I can trust you that God really sent you to come for me. And I want to give you that opportunity there um, this afternoon. I want to give you that opportunity to make that decision. Because, you know, um, with Harry Truman, there was, there was a time when they came, and every time they came, he could have said yes. He could have gone with them. And that was the right time to make the decision. There was no time to delay because they had no idea when the volcano would actually blow. They had no idea when that pyroclastic flow would actually hit that lodge. And it's the same for us, even today. You know, we have no idea when this world is going to, to simply blow apart. All the signs are that it's coming very, very soon. And so now is the time. Now is the time to say to that official from God, from the government in heaven, yes, I'm willing to trust you 
you've passed the, the trust test, you've passed the identity test, I'm going to follow you no matter where you take me because I want to, to live with you forever. You've won my trust. And I want to give you that opportunity this afternoon. Uh, Tim and, and um, his team have, have got a number of decision cards that we would like to, to give out to you uh, this afternoon. And you can make a number of decisions. And no matter where you're at in your journey, in your spiritual journey, because I know that you've been journeying with, with Fountain over the last few weeks, few months, maybe even years. You've been here, but maybe you've been like Harry Truman. Maybe you still haven't said yes to Jesus. You've said yes to Fountain because you're here. But the question is, have you said yes to Jesus? And on this, on this sheet here, which is coming around, and there's pencils as well so that you can um, put down your decision, there's, there's three decisions. So it's, it's not complicated at all. It's just a simple decision that you could make, um, that, that you can follow Jesus. The first one is this, is it says, yes, my decision is, yes, I would like to commit to Jesus through baptism. And baptism is, is, is saying, yes, I commit fully. There's, there's nothing that I'm holding back. It's about saying, I am willing to die to myself, go be buried under the water and come back to life new life in Jesus. And I want to tell you this, that is the most amazing decision you'll ever make. I made it when I was 10 years old in Hong Kong at the top of a, an apartment building. But I encourage you, even if you're not 10, maybe you're 20, maybe you're 40 or 50, maybe you're even 80 or 90, you can still make that decision. You can still escape from the volcano which is coming your way, our way. The second decision is this, is, yes, I would like one-on-one -on -one Bible study. So you might be sitting here thinking, you know, I, I really, it's really powerful, but I still have questions about Jesus. Those are amazing prophecies about him. But what about the other ones? What about some of the details? I'd love to study more. I'd love to know who Jesus is really like. I'd like to, to build my trust in him. And if that's your case, I'd like to invite you to, to tick that box and, and say, yes, I like Bible studies, because I know that there's people here who can give you those Bible studies. I know that Tim and Barrett can give you Bible studies. I know the whole leadership team know the Bible so well, and they've committed to Jesus too. But then there's one other um, commitment or decision that you could make right here this afternoon, and that is this. It says this, yes, I would like to join a care group. Now, let me explain what a care group is. It's, it's, a, it's an amazing environment where you get to, to hang out with some really authentic, real people and, and eat together, have fun together, just, uh, just laugh together, but also have that deeper joy in life as, as well. And you, you can join a group. And there's groups right across the city uh, that you could join. So there's one that's close to, to where you are. Maybe you're studying here or maybe you're working in the city. There's a, there's a care group that you can join, people that you can learn and grow with. And there's two places there, and this is very, very important. Um, to, to make a decision, it also requires to say, yes, I'm going to put my name to it. And I want you just to think about it, that, that maybe you're sort of struggling there and saying, do I, do I really go ahead? Do I really tick that box? Do I really put my name down there? But I want you to think about Jesus. I want you to think about Jesus. You know, he was thinking there in heaven. He was thinking to himself, do I really want to go into that dark world? Do I really want to go to a place where, where there's so much crime and so, so much hardship? Do I really want to die on a Roman cross? And when he thought about it, he thought to himself, you know, there's at least one person in a lecture theater in UTS on 17th of September, 2016, someone who's going to make a decision for me, and I'm going to do it. I'm going to make that decision. I'm going to get, step out of my comfort zone. I'm going to put my name to it. Jesus said, I'm going to, to sign my name in blood. And I want you, if, when you just think about what Jesus did, and put your name down and say, if he was able to do that, if he was able to, to commit himself, you can put your name down and put your contact number as well. 
I want to really encourage you, you know, that this world is, is a terrible place. There are literally fathers who are willing to kill the relatives of, of, of a, a young baby just because they want to get revenge. There's people who are willing to, to blow up family courts and churches. There are things in this world like volcanoes and hurricanes which kill hundreds and thousands of people. But you can escape. You can be part of a group of people who are going to experience God's love and heaven for all of eternity. And my invitation for you is make that decision today. Don't, don't wait any longer at all to make that decision for Jesus. Let me pray as, as we finish here. Father in heaven, I just want to thank you. I want to thank you that, that you were so courageous that you saw this world which had abandoned you, which had broken our trust with you. We, we'd, we'd said, we don't want you. And yet you said, I'm still coming. In spite of their rejection, in spite of the fact that they said, no, we don't want you, you still came. You sent your only son, Jesus. But even more than that, um, uh, Lord, you, you gave us all of the information that we need. Hundreds or uh, for over 40 prophecies, um, God, that, that said, yes, this is the person. This is the person that you sent with a probability of one in 10 to the power 157. You know, trying to find that silver coin in all of New South Wales would never be able to do it. But you've done it, God. You've done it in the person of Jesus. And I want to pray, Father, there's people here this afternoon who are in the process of making that decision. They've put down on their cards, yes, I want to, want to follow you. Yes, I want to be baptised. I want to learn more. And maybe even someone here right now is still thinking about that, still undecided. And Father, I pray now that through your supernatural power and your supernatural presence, you would speak to that person's heart. Because Lord, I'm just a human being. I'm, I'm just like one of your prophets with all of my foibles. I'm just... With, with all of my idiosyncrasies. But you are God. You are present here. You can speak to every single person's heart. You have the power to transform people's lives. And I pray that as you speak to each person, that they would know, they would know that they can trust you. They can trust you not only now, but in the week to come, the rest of this year, and for all eternity as well, is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.